The time has come to modernize this 34-year-old Akai S900 sampler. The original backlit screen is dim and of little use when working in low-light situations, though the LCD characters are as blocky as they ever were back in the 1980s. The double-density 3.5-inch floppy disk drive stores up to 1 megabyte without issue now, but is mechanical and will eventually need maintenance and repair as it wears out. Samples load from floppies and are held in sample memory totaling 750 kilobytes, but disks can fail since they are wearable magnetic forms of storage, and they take up a fair amount of space if you have a vast collection. I acquired a diskette containing JX synthesizer samples with the recent purchase of this S900. If you love the sound floppy drives offer up, nothing excites more than the violent clunk and were of an Akai S900 searching for and extracting or saving data. 11 samples load into memory in just under 60 seconds in this case. Some of this certainly has to do with the disk drive's ability to find and transfer the bits of data that comprise the sample information. But the processing speed and slower memory bus factor in as well. We are talking about 1980s technology. Back then, processing speed was measured in megahertz, not gigahertz. So waiting up to 60 seconds for one megabyte of data to load into any sort of computer processor, that was actually fairly reasonable. By today's standards, however, it's fairly frustrating. So one of the drawbacks to using old sampler technology like this is it takes a long time to load and save samples, and you have very limited memory to work with. Upgrading to a new data storage medium isn't probably going to change the speed of anything.
I've selected a GoTech USB floppy emulator with HXC software installed and specifically configured for an Akai S900. Shay from Night Crew, a seller on Reverb, was very helpful and answered all of my questions prior to my purchase. Now, this is not a sponsored video, but I do have a link to Shay's listing for the GoTech USB floppy emulator in the description below. Upon request, the Akai OS version 4.0, or as Akai designated it, S9V 2.0, is set to auto load on boot up with this emulator. A USB drive was included in the sale. There are videos here on YouTube that show you how to set up the emulation software for the GoTech if you're a DIY kind of person. I opted to just purchase a pre-configured emulator. I do have a link in the description, however, to help you out if you want to flash the emulator device yourself with the aid of a Windows PC. So check it out and support those brave folks out there who dig in first so the rest of us can greatly benefit. The GoTech is not specifically designed to fit the physical floppy drive opening on the S900. Its width is okay, but the height is 5 eighths of an inch shorter, so there will be a gap when it's installed in the S900. When I unrack gear, I do my best to eliminate rack rash, so I slide something protective under the piece coming out to protect whatever's below it. Now the S900 is quite heavy, so in this case, supporting the back of the unit makes sliding it forward an easier maneuver. A copy of the service manual takes out any guesswork, but disassembly is pretty straightforward. To open the top cover, the rack ears must be removed. There are four screws on each ear. Once the ears are off, there are two screws on each side of the lid that come out, and one final screw on the back lip of the cover. The top then lifts off to reveal the guts of the sampler. There are six screws that hold the faceplate in place, and they need to be removed. Three on the top, and three on the underside of the faceplate. Next, the record, monitor, and output knobs are removed with a nice firm pull. And with a little finesse, the metal faceplate comes off the chassis without too much hassle. Now something you'll notice during disassembly is the build quality and the engineering design becomes very apparent. It's rare to see electronics or studio gear built like this nowadays. There are four screws holding the floppy drive in place on the underside of the sampler. With the aid of a magnetic screwdriver, the screws can be carefully lifted out of the chassis through holes once undone. The floppy drive slides forward a bit, but is still tethered to the internal boards by a still standard 4-pin power connector and a 34-pin data ribbon cable. Turning the sampler onto its side makes both connectors easy to access. Carefully cut the cable tie binding the floppy power wires to the other power harness and then gently wiggle the floppy power connector loose. The data cable can be loosened with a firm grip on either side of the connector head. The connector can then be tucked underneath the power board into the space below where the floppy drive is housed. Be aware that the edge of the PC boards are sharp enough to nick the cables. Once the floppy power and data cables are disconnected and fed behind the power board, removing the drive itself from the front bay is not a problem. Make note that the blue stripe on the data cable connects to pin number 2 on the old floppy drive. Pin number 2 on the GoTech emulator will also receive this blue stripe, and the blue stripe will align with pin number 2 on the PC board in the sampler as well. For reference, here are some photos of the original floppy drive removed from the S900. An even pull removes the data cable from the old drive, and lifting up the small tab on the power connector while gently pulling it makes the cable easy to remove. The same cables are now used on the emulator. 
While the power connector only fits one way, be sure to connect the data cable with the blue stripe at pin number 2, which is closest to the power connector. There is also a tab on one side of the data cable that is received at the notch on the underside of the emulator. As mentioned earlier, the emulator is smaller than the original floppy drive in some dimensions. So here's a series of comparisons. There are mounting holes on the GoTech plastic body that are spaced out the same as the screw holes on the original floppy case. I used a slightly smaller screw to bite into the plastic better than the machine screws used with the original drive. Feed the power and data cables back into the sampler through the drive bay opening and then maneuver those connectors between the power board and the PC board. It will take some finagling since the cables have less slack because the emulator body is shallower than the original drive but it can be done somewhat easily while the emulator waits on the edge of the drive bay opening. Reconnect drive power in the one direction that is possible and pay close attention to be sure that the blue stripe on the data cable is aligned with pin 2 on the PC board. Even pressure on both sides of the data cable connector will pop it into place securely with a little patience. And finally, hold the plastic emulator body firmly against the bracket in the drive bay while tightening the screws to lock the GoTech in place. Let's see if the sampler recognizes the new drive. When the sampler is powered up, the OLED screen on the emulator comes to life and the auto boot file containing OS4 is ready to be loaded into the sampler. Pressing the disk button and then enter loads OS4 overriding the EEPROM containing OS 1.2. This needs to be done every time the machine is powered up. For safety's sake, I've gotten in the habit of selecting a blank disk to avoid accidentally saving over OS4 in the auto boot file. I'll record and save a new sample to test out the emulator. Let's go to record mode and uh, begin to name the new sample being recorded. There's nothing unusual here, no new set of commands or operational changes just because the GoTech is installed. The S900 doesn't even know the floppy drive has been replaced with something more modern. In fact, the speed of loading and saving samples appears to be the same. So I'll record a normal sample with a 5 kHz bandwidth at a 5 second length, triggered from C3 on the controller keyboard. I'll let the Akai start recording with an audio level threshold I determine, just to be sure the super bass station at the input is being heard by the S900. Well, there we are. And uh, here we go. Let's record it. The level is lower at playback on the S900, but I can increase the loudness under the sample edit menu. I'll select the pony sample I just created. Now I can toggle over here and increase the loudness for playback every time I strike a key. Now that's better. Now I'll edit the program itself, not just the sample. The sample is part of a program that you can save. In this case, I'm only using one sample, so I will change the name of the program to match the name of the sample. So the name of the sample is Pony. I'm going to change the name of the program to Pony Program. I need to make sure that the key group is correctly playing the correct sample. We don't want the key group to play the tone, which is the sine wave tone that boots up with the S900, we want the key group to play the pony sample we just recorded.
go back to disk mode and now we're going to save the sample that's been recorded and the program that we've created for it so we will go over here to clear ensemble and save we're going to save both the program and the sample to the floppy disk emulator it doesn't go any faster with the emulator than it did with the floppy disk drive which is disappointing but not surprising Old samplers such as this lose the contents of their memory when you power them off. So we're going to boot up again. And now we're going to just load the sample program we've created into memory. Of course, I'm going to auto load OS4 first, because remember, anything sampled under OS4 needs to be loaded and played back under OS4. You can't revert back to 1.2. I've toggled over to a floppy that has our sample and program saved to it and now we will load it under the disk mode function and voila it is now loading the pony sample in the pony program we'll go back to play mode here works on the sampler, how about the keyboard?